You're listening to the Place We Find Ourselves podcast. I'm Adam Young, and today's episode is an interview with Sam Williamson, who wrote a book called Hearing God in Conversation. This interview is a follow-up to episode 38, The Process of Learning to Hear from God. If you enjoy my interview with Sam, you might want to go back and listen to episode 38 or even listen to it again. My prayer for the Place We Find Ourselves podcast has always been, God, may your sheep hear your voice as they are listening to mine. There is a conversation possible. God speaks to you. Remember that if you want to listen to episodes as soon as they are released, you need to download the Place We Find Ourselves app. Episodes will be available for free four weeks after they are released to the app. So if you want to support the podcast for $2.99 a month and get immediate access, instructions are on my website. Thanks for listening. Here's my interview with Sam. So I've got Sam Williamson here with me today. Sam, it's good to see you. It's good to see you too, Adam. It's been a long time. I appreciate your patience. Yeah, uh, it's taken us a while to connect. So some of you may remember that I did an episode a while back about the process of learning to hear from God. And one of the books that I mentioned in that episode, uh, Sam wrote called Hearing God in Conversation. It was very meaningful to me, very helpful. And so I thought we would get uh, the author on the line and have some more conversation about... Uh, this very important topic of how is it that we come to learn to have, as you put it, conversation with God. But before we get into your book, Sam, can you say a little bit about who you are, where you are, what you're interested in and passionate about? A thumbnail sketch is I was raised in just a really good Christian family. I mean, I'm the, the more I talk to people, the more I realize what a blessing my parents were. I just didn't know it at the time. I thought that I wanted to go in the ministry. I did do sort of missionary work, if you will, college ministry overseas for three years, a little over three years in Europe. And while I was there, I heard God. I felt like God say, I shouldn't do it. Not now. I specifically felt him say, if you do ministry work now, you'll create an Ishmael. Sort of the idea of Abraham wanting to fulfill God's word, but he did it on his own time in his own way. I would say the thing that I'm most passionate about is helping people develop intimacy with God, a real connection with God, a personal connection with God. So we'll get into the book in a minute. But first, can, can you say some about when did you first begin to have conversation with God? I mean, when did that open up for you? My parents had taught us to hear God in our family devotions, which we had six nights a week. And one of the things uh, my parents taught us was to hear God. But, you know, I don't know as a 10-year-old that I paid a lot of attention. But what I had heard from Sunday school was the Ten Commandments. And, you know, the Sunday school teachers weren't very clear about adultery. I felt very safe as a 10-year-old because I didn't know what it was. And they weren't very clear about coveting either. It wasn't clear to me, but they made up for their ambiguity when it came to cussing or to to the to the taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. They said, you shall not swear. And what they meant was you shall not cuss. For me, cussing was a sin on the order of mass genocide. In fourth grade, I went to school and cussing had become sort of the in thing. And all the cool kids were cussing and the kids who weren't so cool weren't cussing. And one day I was chasing my whatever you want to call it, my 10-year-old girlfriend, Diane. And I remember catching her, you know, tag, we were just playing tag, and she yelled out, shit. And Adam, I'm 60 now, so that was 50 years ago. I can still feel that visceral punch in the stomach. I, I jumped back seven feet. I, I was afraid God was going to strike her with lightning. And nothing happened. I was really shocked by that. I sort of watched school for a week or two, and I noticed the cool kids got cooler if they cussed, and the non-cool kids weren't cussing, and I just decided there was no God, because God would bless the righteous, right, Adam, and he would, you know, curse those sinners, and I decided there was no God, and the next day I went to school, and I had I had the filthiest mouth in the city of Detroit. I swear, Adam, 
I used every single word. I dropped F-bombs like hardwood forests drop autumn leaves. Uh, and I didn't even know what it meant. I just knew it was really bad. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I went home and I was changing out of school clothes into play clothes. And I heard God as clear as a bell. I mean, I, it was really very clear. And I felt like God say, Sam, I am real and you don't understand. It was so real to me. Uh, I, even though I was just a 10-year-old kid, it was so real that I, I believed it. So that was the first time I heard God's voice. And then as you grow up, um, teenager, 20s, et cetera, what does the process look like for you? I mean, we're, we're all in a process of growing in our ability to hear from God. It's a process. Oh, how has that process unfolded for you? My parents, again, I'm going to keep coming back to what my parents did. They were really good. One of the things they did was they taught us to hear God for each other. You know, they taught us a lot of different things. And... Um, one of the things they taught us was, so we were sitting, we'd sit in a circle in the family room and my dad says, okay, each one of us is going to pray for the person on our right. And I just want you to hear a word from God. And, um, so we all prayed, you know, for two minutes and I was praying for my sister, Sarah. And then we had to go around and share what we had heard. And when it was my turn, I said, you know, Sarah, I think God says he loves you. My dad looked at me and he said, you didn't hear a thing, did you? I said, not a word. He said, well, why do you think that is? Why do you think you didn't hear anything? I thought a minute and um, I said, maybe I don't have to do something special for God for him to love me. And my dad said, I think you just heard God. You know, and he was right. And the thing that I liked about that was God spoke to me. And I, and I do believe that was God speaking to me. I mean, I think that was wisdom beyond a 12 or 14 year old, whatever I was. God spoke to me at a time that I really wasn't looking for him to speak to me. I was looking to give my sister a great word so I would look, you know, super spiritual. <laughs> but God said something to me in the midst of that. I want to read two very simple sentences from your book. It's actually in the preface. And here are the sentences. They're very simple. You said, my parents taught us that we were redeemed in order to have a restored relationship with God. And the basis of every real relationship is communication God saved us to have a conversational relationship with him. This is not rocket science. I, and yet when I read it, I was like, wow, his logic seems to make a lot of sense. Your parents' logic to you seemed to make a lot of sense. And yet hearing God, talking to God, conversing with God was not something that I had much experience in. But then I started thinking, you know, oh my gosh, this could be so cool. This, and I felt kind of like a 10-year-old kid, just excited about something new. What I want to ask you is, if God's so interested in having a conversational relationship with us, uh, why do many of us lack this level of intimacy with God? I mean, as you've talked with people, what have you come to understand are some of the reasons that many of us lack not even that level of intimacy, but even the hope that it's possible. A few key reasons. I would say the first is a set of people have been taught that God doesn't speak today. Or, 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 or if they haven't been taught, there's sort of a silence about it. But Jesus had died, gone to heaven. Paul was doing a missionary journey. And God speaks to him in a vision, in a dream, to go somewhere else. Well, why can't God do that to us? To say God only speaks in Scripture, if you look at Scripture, God speaks everywhere. You know, and so if you really believe God speaks in Scripture, then you got to believe he's speaking today because God speaks everywhere. Did God change? I don't think so. I think the second reason, is, and I think this is maybe, you know, right up there with the first reason. Most Christians I speak with think they're not good enough to hear God. I, I guess what I want to say is, God doesn't speak to us because of our goodness. He speaks to us because of his goodness. If you look at scripture, God spoke to Abraham, who was an idolater and a, and a liar. He spoke to Balaam through his ass, his donkey. He spoke to Samuel, who was a child. He spoke to David, who was an adulterer. He spoke to me, who was a 10-year-old cusser, atheist. You know, God doesn't speak to us because of how good we are. You go on to say that many of us have low expectations for hearing God. And then you go continue. Yet in a crisis, almost all of us look to him for direction. 
Our problem is that the clarity of his words depends on our ability to recognize his voice, and that is hard to learn in a crisis. If we want to hear God in the storm, let's first learn to hear his voice in the calm. Many of us have low expectations for hearing God. Let's take let's talk for a bit about our low expectations. What, and you've already touched on this, but why do you think most of us tend to have low expectations for hearing God? I think part of it is experience. You know, we've tried to hear God and we feel like we haven't, or we compare ourselves to other people's stories and we haven't. In a certain sense, our modern technological world, which so fills us with stimulus that it's very hard to be just quiet. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think it's hard to just quiet ourselves. And I think that we have, we have low expectations that if we actually do quiet ourselves, anything will happen. The more I think about this, the more I realize just how absurd it is that for so long, I didn't think it was possible to hear from God. I mean, God created words. God created our ears. God created the idea of a relationship in which you talk to a friend and your friend talks back to you and you grow in intimacy with each other. I mean, these are God's ideas. This is his creation. And yet somehow we think it's ludicrous that the God who created words and ears and relationships would speak to us on a regular basis through words, to our ears, in our hearts, through a real relationship. And your book, your book invited me to take seriously the possibility that I could have a conversational relationship with God on a day-to-day basis. I, I love the, the fact that you bring that up, that God gave us eyes, ears, mouths, and he doesn't expect us to see, hear, and speak with him. I mean, it's, and you know, we're made in his image. A few days ago, I was reading some, I think it's 115, where God is mocking the idols of the nations around Israel. And he says, they have eyes that do not see, ears that do not hear, and mouths that do not speak. Now, he's obviously comparing those deaf, dumb, and blind idols to himself. And so he's saying he has ears, eyes, and mouth, and he wants us to hear them. Yes. And you go on to say that God speaks with more methods than we normally attribute to him, but he also speaks in more moments than we imagine. I believe he wants to speak in every moment, you write. He doesn't limit himself to Sunday sermons or personal prayer times. So can you say more about this idea that God speaks in more moments than we think? I mean, how can I begin to open myself to hearing from God in these moments? If God is constantly speaking, there's a passage in Job, I don't remember where, it says God speaks time and time again, but nobody notices. I would say that, God is very interested in our lives. He's interested in what we think about. He's interested in what we fear, what we're excited about. And sometimes we don't even know what we fear and what we're excited about. What I've learned to do is to be aware. And so if I'm in a movie and I start to tear up, and you know, we've all done that. And I used to, you know, just (laughs) wipe my eyes and try to forget it. And now I say, God, what's that about? Yes. Why am I weeping? You're opening yourself to a moment in which God might be speaking to you through a film. Exactly. I could be at the movie theater. I could be watching Netflix in my basement. When something stirs me, I think God is often revealing something about me and also revealing something about himself. So when I'm stirred, it's good to say, God, why did that bring tears? Why did that make me angry? Yeah, and to consider the possibility that when I'm moved, as I become aware of it, this may be God speaking to me. Absolutely. He's stirring things. And it's not the still small voice that sometimes he uses. In this case, it's a film, or it's a song, or it's something in nature, but you're moved and you're tearing up. And could it be that this is God? who cares about my day-to-day life, speaking to me about something in my heart. If it wasn't God, now I, I think it was God, but let's say it wasn't God. Let's say you tear up. Well, who do I want to go to to find out why I teared up? I happen to think God arranges things, but even if God didn't, if, if I just all of a sudden discover a mystery inside myself, it's good to be curious about it. And who is the best person to be curious with? Ask God. 
chapter three, you title How to Recognize the Voice of God. And in that chapter, you say, I think God prefers a still small voice because we are so easily distracted by the spectacular. It's so easy to go from one emotional high to the next, but God wants a relationship. Sometimes he speaks in stunning ways, but mostly his voice seems quite ordinary, just a nudge or a sense, an idea that persists, an urging on a boring evening. You're appealing to the ordinariness of God's voice. How did you begin to recognize the ordinariness of God's voice, and why do you use that term? I had a lot of exposure to the charismatic renewal in my life, and you know I was involved in it, and I think there's I think it's good. So I'm not saying anything negative about it, except that I knew several people who really liked the spectacular more than the ordinary. And I began, I just began to wonder because so much of life is ordinary. You know, I mean, we wake up, we go to work, we kiss our wife when we come home. Most of life is ordinary. And and I would hate for my life to be, I can only hear God in those spiritual high moments on the Mount of Transfiguration. Honestly, Adam, most of my life is ordinary. I, I think that knowing that I can be with God adds something to the yes, humdrum yes. of life where it's not so much humdrum anymore. It's not, Ordinary becomes extraordinary instead of just ordinary. Yes. The ordinary day-to-day life can become very sacred and holy when it exists in conversation with our God. And so when it comes to hearing the voice of God, uh, in chapter 12, titled, How Can I Know It's God's Voice? And you say there's a feel to the voice of God that we learn to recognize. It simply takes time and experience. The more we hear his voice, the more we recognize it. And, And this is what Jesus is getting at in John 10 when he says, My sheep know my voice. And so you're saying there's a feel to the voice of God. What What's the feel of the voice of God for you? We have a piano and we have a piano tuner that comes, I think, once a year-ish, you know, to tune a piano. And one day she said to me, you know, Sam, the the body of the piano is like a resonance chamber. And if you hum the right note into the body of the piano, the corresponding string will, will vibrate. So she played the A, you know, the 440A. She played it a few times. Then she dampened the strings and she said, hum it. So I said, hum. And the A string started to vibrate without me touching it, without me plucking it, without me hitting the A string. And, you know, she just thought it was cool. I was astounded because I felt like in some ways that's the best description I have for when God speaks to me is there's like a resonance in my heart. You know, somewhere in Romans, it says the spirit of God confirms with our spirit that we are children of God. Uh, And, and that's what happens is I can know I'm a child of God, but then when God speaks it, something in my heart vibrates, you know, or, or on the road to Emmaus, The disciples later said, we're not our hearts burning within us. You know, that works for me too. I I would say over time, there's this resonance in my heart. There's this vibrating in my heart. There's this burning in my heart. The way I've heard it explained from a guy named Craig McConnell, who, who died a couple of years ago with Ransom Heart Ministries, is he said, it's as if the sentence or the phrase that he's hearing is asterisked. And I loved that it's because there are times when I'm listening to God and the way I distinguish my own thoughts from the voice of God is there's a weightiness to God's voice. There's an, it's as if it's just asterisked. And that's what I think of when you share the story about the piano, there's a resonance in my spirit that this has import and it sounds like the God that I know. So for example, when I'm, I've got an 11 year old daughter, Hope, and she knows my voice. I don't mean she knows the sound of it. She knows the kinds of things I frequently say to her. And so if a friend said to her, you know, your dad said such and such, she would say, "Uh, that doesn't sound like my dad. 
because she knows the sound of my voice. And in time, and particularly through reading scripture, we begin to recognize the tenor of the voice of God. And it's always kind, and it's never accusatory. And it, as you said earlier, it doesn't coerce, it doesn't run over us, it honors us, but often with a sense of either disruption or invitation or a kindness that is inviting us to a different way of being in the world. But it, it, there is a, a, a tenor, a tone to the voice of God that I am in the process of learning to distinguish from the other voices in my head. I want to address something that I think is extremely practical and often an obstacle to hearing from God and really gets to the heart of the matter. When most of us quiet our hearts to listen to God, there are a lot of voices speaking. We have all these voices inside. What do you do with the voices that come up as you're listening to God, Sam? What do you do with the other voices inside? Number one is I don't know if everybody recognizes that there's a lot of voices inside. And just to recognize it is a huge first step. You know what I do with the voices? Some some voices are obvious. You know, there's there's voices that say you're an idiot or you stu- you're stupid or I remember what you did. You know, there's there's some things that we can get rid of easily. But have you ever have you ever done brainstorming for a business meeting? You know, a few of you get together in a room with a whiteboard. And the way you'll often start a whiteboard meeting, a brainstorming meeting, is you say, okay, we're going to throw all the ideas up on the whiteboard. And sometimes when I'm waiting to hear God's voice and I hear a bunch of voices, I just start writing the different different voices I hear down. I don't necessarily give them a name. I'll say, you're too stupid to do this. It's too scary to do this. Who are you to say to be saying this? I write them down just to quantify them or to, you know, so that, so that I can see them. And then I pause and say, okay, let's just go back and look at these. And sometimes when you just see it uh, and then you narrow it down. And usually when you narrow it down, you now narrow it down to a few things that are the obvious lies from Satan or from the wounds in our hearts or from the world. So sometimes I use this brainstorming method where I'm looking for that resonance in my heart. As we learn to do that, the other voices lose some of their power. What would you say to people that have been in relationship with God for a while, but have never really known that they could have conversation with him? Because I think that's a lot of the listeners. What, what would you say to people in that spot, in that place? If you want to learn to have a conversation with God, then initiate it. Just like I might initiate it with you. Adam, if you were over at our house tonight after dinner and, and you said, so what's going on with you, Sam? I might say, well, you know, I'm in a transition. I'm writing a book and I'm struggling with how to do it in the right way. And I'm, you know, and I just start talking to you about some of the struggles I'm having. Well, if I would do it with you as a friend, why couldn't I do that with God? You know, instead of praying, oh, God, help me with this book. I can just say, you know, Father, I, I feel like you're asking me to write this book. I just feel like I can't do an adequate job and I'm, and I'm scared that I can't do an adequate job that I just sharing with him. I'm not even necessarily asking for advice. I'm just talking with him the same way I would talk with you word for word. If you're struggling, how to con- have a conversational relationship with God, start talking to him the way you would talk to a friend about anything about work, your spouse, your fears, your joys, the projects you're working on. You know, Father, I'm making a frame for our kayaks, and I just um, – this is the idea I'm thinking of. What do you think of it? I mean, why can't I do that with God? You're inviting us to treat God like a real person, like a real friend. Like a real friend. And, and to talk with God the way we would talk to each other at a coffee shop as we're checking in with each other about our days and our lives. You know, most people think of prayer as asking God for things. I I really do think prayer is just talking to God. So as you've talked with people over the years, what have you found often gets in the way of people hearing from God besides not taking the time to listen? For those people that, that, that are initiating, that are taking the time to listen, that do believe it's possible, 
what are some of the things that get in the way of people hearing from God? Doubt. You know, even when God speaks, sometimes we doubt that it's his voice. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because we really don't think he speaks to us. We really don't think he loves us. We really don't think he wants a relationship. You know, it's the head knowledge and the heart knowledge. So we have doubt. I think that secondly, I think most of the time we're looking for direction. I tell the story in the book about my dad, how he taught me to sail. And my dad one summer took me out sailing. We had a sunfish. I grew up with a sunfish, a little sailboat. My dad took me out on Lake Michigan. We went out every day for a few hours out on the boat. And while we're out there, he would just talk to me. In fact, it's the very thing we were just talking about, a conversation. He'd say, why did you get mad at your sister? And I'd say, why did you get mad at mom? And he, you know, he'd say, what book are you reading? And I'd tell him and he'd tell me. And it was just a conversation. Now, along the way, he would say, turn right, turn left. And after several weeks of this, he said, okay, Sam, take the boat out by yourself. And I took the sunfish out on Lake Michigan beyond the sight of land as a, as a 10, 10 year old. And the thing that's amazing is my dad gave me guidance. He didn't use a PowerPoint. He didn't use a flip chart. He didn't use an outline, but I, I knew how to sail. I knew how to sail. My dad had guided me and it was all just by having, I never knew he was guiding me. It was just a conversation. So we're looking for guidance, but I think God wants conversation. And that's one of the reasons we miss his voice is he wants to hear how we're doing. And we're saying, should I take this job? Should I take this job? He's saying, I'll take care of it. Last quote I want to read. You say that the secret to a lifetime of hearing God lies in learning to distinguish God's voice from the clamor of other voices in our lives. The best way to become familiar with God's voice is to meditate on his word. Say more about listening to God by reading scripture. What does this look like for you uh, and for others you know? So meditation is one of the words that's just used throughout scripture. When I read a passage, I ask myself these three questions every time, every day. I say, what does this passage say about God? What does this passage say about me? And how can it make me adore him? And I'm thinking, but I'm thinking in the presence of God. So I'm not doing, I'm not doing this abstractly. There's a difference between reading the scripture by myself and reading the scripture in the presence of God, expectant for the spirit of God to speak to me as I'm reading. Absolutely, Adam. It's the difference between reading a menu at a restaurant and eating a meal. And it's it's a different posture of my heart. And I know how it feels inside when I'm reading it uh, by myself and when I'm reading it in God's presence, awaiting the spirit to speak to my heart through the words that I'm reading about my life and about me and about the people that I'm in relationship with. It's a different posture and it requires a fair bit of hope. It requires hope that my God actually cares enough about my day-to-day life to speak to me through his word in the context of my life right now. Sam, thank you for your time today. Thanks for your reflections. Uh, Thank you for your book. If people want to get in touch with you or read more about you, what's the website? The website is beliefs, B-E-L-I-E-F-S, beliefsoftheheart.com. And they can can email me at sam at beliefsoftheheart.com. Thank you, Sam. It's uh, It's been good to be with you today. Thank you, Adam. You're a very gracious interview. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you want to get the next episode as soon as it is released, please download the Place We Find Ourselves app and support the podcast by paying $2.99 per month. Instructions are on my website. Have a great week.